All right. So uh, once again, I want to talk about union with Christ and basically flesh out what it means to have an intimate relationship with Jesus and um, really kind of pursue that or lay out the, at least the, the premise that that should be the supreme goal of every single believer. And I think sometimes even we as pastors in churches and and, and preachers and Christian books and conferences uh, fail to emphasize the importance of that part of our relationship with the Lord. And I think as a result that many times Christians in our churches and even mature believers in our churches struggle with things because they're actually chasing after the wrong things. And so um, we're going to spend a lot of time just looking at a lot of verses today because I want to lay a foundation. But but basically, if, if, if we laid out, and I'm talking about from 40 years of ministry if here, if we laid out what the typical progression of the Christian life is. So if I asked you, and, and I'll answer the question, but just to think about it, if I asked you, okay, what are, what are the steps, the, the typical steps in our walk with the Lord and in our our our, our growth and, and our spiritual maturity. Most people would probably whittle those down to three things, all right? And I think I put them in your notes. So I say it this way, the typical progression of the Christian life presented in most sense settings is developed like this, faith, obedience, and service, all right? So faith, let me flesh those out a little bit. And by the way, I don't disagree with any of those three. So I'm certainly not against any of those three. So faith is when we begin an encounter with Jesus Christ. So we hear the gospel, we realize that we are a sinner in need of Jesus, and we respond to the gospel. So all of that happened at different points in our lives. So that happened to me 52 years ago. You know, for some of you, you know, that happened a long time ago. For others, it might not have happened that long ago. But it, it's when our faith journey begins. And at that moment, our faith is new. And we begin learning. We begin growing. And that's an exciting season. Does anybody remember and maybe you want to just share a testimony. Do you remember when it was that you became a follower of Jesus? And, and do you remember that initial season of growth? Does anybody remember that? Yes. Does anybody have, a, have a, a testimony or something about what that initial season was like for you? It was I good not, though, right? It was I could good. not get enough. I wanted more, 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 more. Yeah, it's almost like you couldn't get enough, right, it's Deb? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It was like you were a sponge, yeah, exactly, and you were just absorbing. All of it was so new, and you were so excited, and you couldn't wait to to get to church, and uh, and you couldn't, uh, I mean, you couldn't wait to open your Bibles. There was just so much excitement in all of that. That's that first step, and all of us go through that first step. The second step is what we would call the step of obedience. And what happens in that step of obedience is we begin maturing in our faith. And so as we learn those things that, that excited Debbie and excited all of us, we begin to learn, okay, there's some things that I shouldn't do in my Christian life, and there are some things that I should do in my Christian life. And so what happens is all of a sudden we, we not only recognize Jesus as our Savior, but now all of a sudden we begin recognizing him as our Lord. And as our Lord, we begin demonstrating obedience to him. And as I mentioned, there's things that we stop doing, um, you know, things that all of a sudden we realize, oh my word, I've done that for years and that's sin. I shouldn't do that. And so I stop that. And then there's things that we start doing. So we start replacing you know, maybe bad things with good things, but it's that period of obedience when all of a sudden we, we just have this desire to be obedient in whatever God tells us to do. The third phase that we would basically mention is participation. And so 
everybody doesn't follow the same trajectory, but it's almost the same thing. So we come to faith in Christ, we begin learning, we begin becoming obedient, and then all of a sudden we realize, okay, man, it's time for me to participate. And, and we're actually challenged to be a part of something. So we become members of Hollywood Community Church or, or whatever it is. And then we join a life group because we're encouraged to participate in something. And then, and then we want to get involved in ministry and, and we begin serving. And, and all of that is really good. So we move now from becoming just a receiver of the word and everything. So now we're actually a participant. So now we're actually involved in some type of ministry. We're not just sitting, but now we are serving as well. So I would say most of us probably walked through that process, you know, different trajectories, but, but we walked through that process. And, and that probably would be the most popular model of Christian formation. And we would even sit back and say, our goal is to be producing faithful servants who love Jesus and are willing to serve him. So I think I put this in your notes. So I say the goal in this popular model of Christian formation is faithful servants. We believe Christ, we obey Christ, and we serve Christ in some way. But then I say this, when we reach this point, though, we kind of hit a spiritual pinnacle in our life. And, and we almost reach this point where we feel like we've arrived and, 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 and maybe you're here, maybe you're not. I'm not asking for anybody to necessarily open up and, and be super transparent. But if we're not careful, we can get to that point. And after a while, we can sit back and think, okay, is this all there is? <laughs> is there more to the Christian experience than this? And one of the things that, that, that I've struggled with in my life is that exact question. So, you, you know, Brian, maybe even according to certain standards, maybe even reached a, another level because I'm in full-time ministry and I'm a pastor. But, but even for all of us at some point, there, there comes a question where you sit back and say, okay, is there more to the Christian life than this? And if we're not careful, we can even, even though we have faith in Christ, we're obedient, and we're serving, if we're not careful, we can reach a point where we feel stuck or even stagnated. And, and maybe you've been there at some point. And I, and I deal with people in ministry all the time that reach that point. And so when they reach that point, they don't know what to do. So, so that's when people lots of times say, you know what, Brian, I think God's leading me to a different ministry because I feel stagnated right now, or I feel stuck right now. And quite frankly, the, the answer to that is not, you know, getting involved in a new ministry. It's not going to a new church. It's not being involved in another life group. But there's an aspect of our Christian experience that we are missing. And, and I say that because I think that, 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 um, that we as pastors bear the fault in this because we use that as the formula for Christian preparation without pushing what I think is the supreme goal of every believer and its union with Christ. And it is developing this intimate, personal relationship with Jesus. So having said that, I say in your notes right there, this, and this is my, this is my premise statement for the next few weeks, and it's this. You were created to have a deeply personal and intimate relationship with God. Sorry about that, everybody. Let me, let me um, mute my phone so that doesn't keep happening, all right? I don't know why I'm so popular right now, but um, so, so, so let me say that again. You and I were created for the purpose of having an intimate, personal relationship with God. More than serving in this ministry, 
more than belonging to something. And you guys know I'm a, I'm a local church guy. So I believe we all need to be involved in the local church. We need to be serving in local church. But even more than that, you and I were created for this intimate relationship with the Lord. I put a quote in, um, in your notes that, that simply says this, and, and let me read it. Um, I want to put my phone on airplane mode. Um, it says this. It's by Albert, Albertus Magnus in a classic book that's called Union with God. He says, surely the most deeply rooted need of the human soul, its deepest aspiration is for the closest possible union with God. So, so the ultimate goal for your life and mine, all right, and, and please understand what I'm saying, is not that we serve more and more and more. It's not that we give more and more and more. And, and don't get me wrong, I want all of you to serve more and more and more. I certainly want all of you to give more and more and more, obviously being a little facetious there. It's not to learn more and more and more, even though that's important, but the ultimate goal of your life and mine in God's eyes is for us to come, become closer and closer and closer to him. And our relationship with him is constantly growing. So, so I kind of want to flesh that out. And, and I'm going to be honest, this is where I am, even in my life, because I grew up, and you guys know my story, I grew up in a legalistic environment in which it was all about doing this and checking off certain things. And, and even though we were told, yeah, you're supposed to have your devotions every day, and yeah, you're supposed to pray, it was almost like they were things that we were supposed to do rather than really growing in my relationship with the Lord, all right? Are you, are you tracking me? Is everybody following along with me today? All right, so, 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 so I, I wanna go somewhere in the next few weeks with us. So, so let's lay the foundation just a little bit, all right? So, so let's start in Genesis chapter three, all right? So, so remember that God created Adam and Eve and he placed them there in the garden he gave them dominion over everything, so he gave them a job to do. You know, and by the way, that idea that work is only the result of the fall, that if Adam and Eve would have never fell, we wouldn't be working, that's not true, because in Genesis chapter 2, they were given a job before they ever fell. So God gave them dominion. He gave them a job to do. But notice in verse 8 of chapter 3, so, so this is the whole fall chapter. But in verse 8, it says this. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So I mentioned that not to talk about the fall, per se, but I mentioned that because I want us to see what Adam and Eve's relationship with God was like before the fall. All right, so, so all of our lives are post-fall relationships, right, or post-fall lives. But, but when God created Adam and Eve and he placed them in the garden, there was an innocence there. There was an unbelievable communion that was there. I say this in my notes. I said, evidently, before the fall, Adam and Eve lived in a state of innocence and enjoyed intimate fellowship with God. And, and what that means is that God walked in the garden among them. So it wasn't odd for God to carry on a relationship with Adam and Eve. It was a constant, frequent relationship. There was regular interaction between Adam and Eve and God. They, they freely interacted with him. But we know that soon as they sinned, that relationship completely changed. And so, you, you know, we have this post-fall relationship with God. But, but I would submit to you that the whole purpose of the gospel is that God desires for us to have the same type of relationship with him that Adam and Eve had before the fall that God desires for us to have that personal, intimate relationship 
with him. Let me show you one more verse before we jump into a couple of things. So now go to the other end of your Bible to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, because John kind of alludes a little bit to what God's purpose for our life is. 1 John chapter 1, not the Gospel of John, 1 John, towards the end of your Bibles. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. John says this, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And notice what he says. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. So here's John kind of pulling back the curtains a little bit and saying, okay, Here's what God wants. God wants us to have fellowship with him. So, so it, it, there's so many things that I could say about that, but, but, but I would just submit to you, and, and, and please, I don't want you to even think that Brian has figured this out, and this is the level that Brian is living on. That is not what I'm saying today, all right? I'm still working on this myself. But I believe that God wants us to have such an intimate personal relationship with him that all of our joy, all of our satisfaction, all of our peace, all of that comes from our relationship with him. So there's never a moment when we feel stuck. There's never a moment that we feel stagnated. There's never a moment that we feel like, oh my word, there has to be more than this because we are receiving absolutely everything we need from our relationship with God. Does that make sense? And what happens is in our lives, and it's just part of our human nature, is we, we strive to find that satisfaction that only God can give us. We strive to find it in other things. And as a result, life is a series of frustrations and disappointments because we were never created to find our complete satisfaction in any of those things. Now, obviously, God in his goodness allows us to experience all of those things and to, to experience joy, and there's a sense of satisfaction in, in working and providing for our family, and there's a sense of satisfaction in having relationships, but but, but none of those things provide the ultimate fulfillment that God desires for us to have. Nor does just being a member of Hollywood Community Church or being learning a list of things that I should do and shouldn't do or even serving in this, as good as all of those things are, those don't give us the sense of fulfillment that our union with Christ gives. So, so, so we were designed to be united with Jesus Christ. So let me give you what that means for a couple of things. And then next week, I want to talk really practical about it. So the first is this. We are united with God positionally. All right? That's the first thing. We are united with him positionally. All right? So we've been talking a lot about justification out of Romans, which is our position. But but, but a phrase that the New Testament uses very frequently to describe our intimate relationship with Christ or with God is the phrase, in Christ. All right, you guys have read that phrase in Scripture, in Christ. The Apostle Paul actually uses that phrase more than 200 times in his epistles. And for Paul, it more often than night ha not has what we call a soteriological meaning. It has a salvation meaning. In other words, being in Christ is the result of our justification and the basis of our ongoing sanctification. So in other words, I'm accepted by God, not because of who I am, not because I'm a wonderful guy, I'm a great husband, I'm a pastor, I'm not accepted by because of any of those things. I'm accepted by God because I am in Christ. 
All right. So, 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 so my complete acceptance by God and everything that God is doing in my life is based upon Jesus Christ and what he's done for me. And so Paul uses that phrase in Christ over and over and over again to describe that intimate relationship. So, so grab your Bibles with me and let's just race through a bunch of verses. All right. So, so I want you to see these. And, and, and you're going to see this phrase over and over and over again. So let's start in Ephesians 1 and verse 1. And we're going to hit a couple of these Pauline epistles right away. But notice Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who were in Ephesus and are faithful. Notice what he says. In Christ. So, so, so he, he doesn't say those that are faithful to Ephesus Baptist Church or Ephesus Community Church. He said those that are faithfully what? In Christ. What's he talking about? That position that they have with Christ because of what Jesus has done for them and them placing their faith and trust in him. So go to the very next book, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints, what does he say again? In Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. What's he talking about? He's talking about people that have this position, this relationship in Christ. Next book, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 2. Colossians 1.2, Paul says, to the saints and faithful brothers, in Christ at Colossae, all right? Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Go back just a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing you backwards. Romans chapter 8 in verse 1. Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, all right? Do you see a, do you see a repetitive formula here? Over and over again, Paul is talking about what? To those of us who are in Christ. One more that said just a little bit different, but go with me to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Paul says it this way I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless, or it is no longer I who live, but notice what he says, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, so, so what is Paul talking about? And we're not going to go there because we've spent four weeks talking about justification and we've been talking about our position. But, but our union with Christ begins whenever we by faith trust in Jesus Christ and we are placed in him. So all of a sudden, it's like being born in one family, but being adopted into another family, and you are now placed in this family, all right? And all of a sudden, you didn't have a relationship with this family, but now, because of your adoption, you have a relationship with this family. That's, a, that's what the New Testament describes over and over and over again. And by the way, there's so many consequences of that. We've talked about that the last couple of weeks. We have peace with God. We have access, 24-7 access into grace. We have future security. We have all of those things, not because of who we are, but because of this relationship, this positional relationship with God that we are in Christ. All right? We get that, right? Okay, so... We have to know that, even though that's not where we're going. We got to know that because that's the basis of where we're going. Okay, so 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 here's the second thing then. And so we are not only united with God positionally, but we are designed to be united with God relationally. That's why we were created. So 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 the fall messed all of that up, but God didn't create us so that we could have wonderful lives and drive nice cars and watch the Ohio State Buckeyes on television and eat our favorite foods and all of that. All of those are benefits that God in his grace gives us. 
but we were created to fellowship with him. And, and sometimes we get so wrapped up in life that we fail to realize the reason for which we were created. So I want to show you two passages in the book of John that illustrate this for us perfectly, all right? And then make a couple of practical applications. And then ne next week, we'll get, get even more practical. So go back with me to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John chapter 15. So, so I want to use a, um, a passage that if you've been at HCC for a long time, if you predate me, you're comfortable with this passage because Buddy McCord, when he was here his last few years, really highlighted this passage in John chapter 15. But, but I want us to catch it. So John chapter 15, let me read verses 4 through 7. You follow along, okay? Here's what Jesus says. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing." If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you ask whatever you wish, and it will be done to you. So, so, so here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that we were created, we are intended to abide in him. The, the term abide has the idea of permanence. It has the idea of steadfastness in our relationship with him. And by the way, you probably saw, remember, that word abide is found, is found 10 times in verses 4 through 10. And in the midst of all of that, John is using, or John or Jesus is using the metaphor of the vine to illustrate his point. He's saying it's only when nutrients can freely fr flow from the vine to the branches, that those branches survive, thrive, and bear fruit. So, so let's put all of that in our analogy. So, so our pattern that we emphasize often for the Christian experience is faith, obedience, and service. And so we, we can follow down that path of faith and begin to obey and begin to put things in practice and begin to serve without really learning what it means to abide in Jesus. And what happens with all of that is we get busy and we end up getting busy and serving in our own strength and in our own power. And, and, and what happens when we, when we serve in our own strength and in our own power? Can somebody tell me? Because we've all probably experienced it. What happens when we serve and we try to live the Christian life in our own strength and our own power? What happens? We burn out. We burn out. We absolutely burn out. Yep, we burn out. We get discouraged. We get defeated. Not because we don't have the right attentions. Not because we don't love Jesus. Not because we're not doing good things. We burn out because we're doing this without being connected to the power source. And so even though we're, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, if, if we're not experiencing this intimate relationship with Jesus, eventually we're going to feel stuck stagnated, and burned out. Let me show you another passage. Go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. John 17, 20 through 23. This is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. You're familiar with this passage. There's a couple of phrases that are really, really cool and illustrate this the same point. So Jesus is praying to the Father, 
in this, and in verse 20, well, we'll jump right in the middle of the prayer. But in verse 20, he says, I do not ask for these only, speaking of the 12 disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. So here's Jesus praying, praying for us. His prayer transcends time. He says that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe you have sent me. Verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Verse 23, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as I, or even as you loved me. I think I said that correctly. So, so, Notice just a couple of phrases there. So in verse 21, once again, Jesus says <coughs> that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. Notice this phrase, that they also may be in us. Now, now does that talk about an intimacy there? I mean, I mean so, so, so Jesus is saying, just as he intimately communicates with the Father, and the Father intimately communicates with him. So he describes this relationship as being in each other, you and me, and I in you. Here's what Jesus says. I long for believers to be in us just as we are in each other. Notice verse 23, once again, he uses the phrase, I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. So, so, so you see where I'm going with all of this. So, so, so all of a sudden he, here's Jesus talking about, and I find it really interesting. He doesn't say, here's the way the world's going to know that, that I am the son of God by more people attending church or by more people serving in the food. And all of those things are extremely important. But Jesus is saying that the world is going to know that the Father sent the Son whenever we, his followers, have this intimate relationship with him. A relationship that is so personal, that, that is so close, that it resembles the relationship that the Father has with the Son, and the Son has with the Father. So, so at the end of the day, here's what God wants from you and me more than anything else. More than anything else, He wants us to relate with Him. More than anything else, He wants us to be developing that relationship with Him. So, Real quick, and then we can talk about it for a second. So what are some action steps in our life towards union with Christ? So if we sit back and say, okay, the, the thing that God wants more than anything else is to have this relationship with me. What are some action steps that we need to take in order to develop this relationship? I'll give you an example. So so, so the thing that, that Vicki loves more than anything else for me to do is to wake up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, and just sit there and talk to her. That's what she wants. I mean, more than, oh, let's sit and, and watch this program on Netflix, or let's go out and do this. What she want? She wants conversation. And, and she wants me to take the time. Now, I don't always do that really well, all right? But, but, but more than anything else, she just wants this conversation. And I think more than anything else, here's what God wants from us. He, he doesn't want us to be so busy serving him that we don't have time for him. He wants us to give him time. So let me give you two action steps, and then we can flesh these out a little bit more next week. The first is this. It's surrender. Surrender. I'm reading actually two books, and I'm going to show you the, them in just a second. That's kind of prompting my thinking. But John Eldridge 
Um, Greg, you might remember John Eldridge. He wrote Wild at Heart. Remember Wild at Heart was really popular back in the, I don't know if HCC or First Baptist ever went through that. There were a lot of men's groups that went through Wild at Heart. So John Eldridge was big on that. He just wrote a new book called Get Your Life Back. And he, he actually calls this idea of surrender, he calls it benevolent detachment. And what he's talking about, he's talking about this idea of daily surrendering everything and everyone in your life to God. And John Eldridge actually has this practice that in, the, that, that in the morning he wakes up and he starts his day like this by saying, okay, God, I now surrender everything in my life to you. And I surrender everyone in my life to you. I take I take my hands off of them. I give up control of them. And, and, and control is something that's really big for all of us. All right. I'm, I'm a, I'm a control freak. I got to admit it. All right. It's hard to lead without being a control freak. All right. I'm a control freak, but, but, but surrender as we sit back and say, okay, God, I take my hands off of everything and I surrender it to you. I think I gave you a quote by, by Augustine that's in your notes. I love this, this quote. Augustine said this, we empty ourselves of all that fills us so that we may be filled with what we are empty of. Isn't that a great quote? So we empty ourselves of all that fills us so that we might be filled with what we're empty of. So, 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 so I would submit this to you, and this is this is Brian's life. This is what this is right where I this is where where the rubber meets the road in Brian's life right now. Okay, if I'm not careful, I fill my life up with so many things, good things, but so many things that there's no room for God in my life, and and God wants to come in. I just don't have any time for him. I just don't have any space for him. I'm, I'm spending too much time doing this and loving my wife and loving my daughter and, and leading and preaching and doing all of this that, that God, I know I'm serving you, but I just don't have a lot of time for you in my life. And Augustine says, no, we have to empty ourselves of all that fills us in order that we might be filled with what we really need. And so someone said this, to make room for God, to fill the vessel of our soul, we must begin moving some of the unnecessary clutter that accumulates in our lives. So I would ask you, do any of you have a junk drawer at home? You, you know, a drawer that you open it up and it just has everything in it. So if you just, every once in a while, you just pick up a bunch of stuff and you put it in the junk drawer right there, right? Every once in a while, you got to empty out the junk drawer, right? Because the junk drawer is full. You don't have room for anything else. So you have to declutter at times. All right. So, so, so I think in our lives, we have to declutter because our lives are so cluttered by everything. We have, we have the television on 24-7 and we're hearing the news and, and we're getting emails and text messages and we're on Facebook and, and we're doing all of this. We have so much clutter in our lives that, that I would submit to you. And, and, and I'm going to be honest, I, I wish I could transparently tell you how God is working in my life on this, but, but I'm afraid so often that we have so much noise in our life that God is speaking, but we can't hear him because there's so many other things in our life. And so union with Christ has this idea of saying, okay, God, I'm recognizing you are the most important thing in my life. So I'm going to declutter. I'm going to surrender all of these other things to you. I'm going to empty it out so that you can fill it. All right. I gave you a bunch of verses there. Um, um, you, you know, Psalm 139, search me, O God, know my heart, try me and know my thoughts. See if there be anything wicked in me and cleanse me. Romans 12, 1, you know, uh, you know um, 
I forget how it started. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Put everything you have on the altar. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The idea is, is taking that load that you have that you can't carry anyways and just emptying it off on God. So the first thing is surrender. The second thing is seeking him. Surrender and seek. So, so here's what seek means. It involves an intentional and a deliberate determination to seek God above anything or anyone else. So, so four verses that all say the same, or three verses that all say the same thing. I'll let you look those verses. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 29, uh, or excuse me, excuse me, Deuteronomy 4, 29, Jeremiah 29, 13, Matthew 6, 33. The idea is this, God says this, if you seek me, you will find me. So, so here's what God doesn't do. God doesn't play a game of cosmic hide and seek, wanting us to seek him, but then He's, he hides himself so well that we never find him. That's not what God does. God says, if you seek me, and in Jeremiah he says, if you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me. Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. So I can't talk about your life, but I can talk about my life. So, so the reason why I struggle with this is because I don't declutter enough and I don't seek God above everything else. And when I say that, I don't want you to think that Brian's this wicked sinner. So thankfully, I don't have any of those things in my life. But, but sometimes we can have so many good things in our life that keep us from the best thing. And so I'm not saying we stop doing things that I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, stop taking care of your family, stop going to work, stop going to church. That's not what I'm saying. You guys know my heart and all of that. What I'm saying is learn to declutter, to, to declutter from your life things that aren't as important to be able to put in it the thing that is the most important thing. And the reason for which you and I were created. And I think when we do that, life begins to make sense. Joy comes back. Peace comes back. Satisfaction comes back. Even in the midst of problems, because all of a sudden, we're not stuck anymore. We're not stagnated anymore. We have this, this vibrancy in our relationship with God. Does that make sense? So let me just show you two books that I'm reading, and um, apart from the Bible, obviously. But I'm reading two books. If you're interested, these are great books. So this is a book by John Eldridge that's called Get Your Life Back. And it's a, it's a really, really, really good book called Get Your Life Back. I'm almost done with it. I'm going to be taking our staff through it in just a couple of weeks called Get Your Life Back. The author is John Eldridge, E-L-D-R-E-D-G-E. -E, and you can get that, obviously, on Amazon. The other one that I'm just starting to read is called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Somebody um, who's a mentor of mine recommended I read this because he told me, and it's true, he said, Brian, you are always in a hurry. He said, even when you are sitting down between your two ears, you are in a hurry, all right? And if you know me, that's a pretty good indication of who I am. I'm always racing from one thing to the other, and it's hard, it's hard to just sit at God's feet when your mind is always racing and your heart is always racing from one thing to another. So those are just some things that I'm doing in my life. So next week, here's what I want to talk about. Who's the author for that one? Uh, this one is called, it's John Mark Comer. John Mark Comer, C-O-M-E-R. Don't get that one, honey. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. She wants that one. She said, that's Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Is that 
Well, she's probably right, Greg, because Vicky said that was me right away. So she's probably right. So, so, so next week I want to talk about, uh, all right, so what are some things that break our union with Christ? All right, so even if you and I sit back today and say, okay, I'm all in on this. All right, I'm going to do this. I'm all in. You guys know as well as I do within the next 24 hours, it's going to be really easy and something's going to distract you and me. And so what are some things that break our union with Christ? I want to talk about that next time. Okay. Anybody have a question or, or a thought? Pastor Brian. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell me what number two is to fill in the blank? I missed I it. I sure can. It is relationally. So Thank we are you. designed to be united with God relationally. All right. So, so, Hey, the only thing I can tell you is, Hey, I'm just, I'm just sharing with you what God's teaching me. So these are things that are really, really um, on my heart and God's really working in my life. So um, sorry, you're uh, having to sit through the things that Brian's learning. You maybe have learned these a long time ago, but I'm remedial. I got to be reminded of this over and over and over again. I'm pretty hard headed. All right, let me have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Okay, Father, we love you. And Lord, thank you so much for each of these folks who, Lord, love you. And so God, I pray that you would give us this passion in our lives to, to, um, to take our hands off, to declutter, to empty ourselves so that you might fill us and help us to seek you with all of our heart. And God, I pray that you'd apply this individually to each of our lives, because everybody listening today has a different life and different struggles and different experiences. So I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would do that individually in our lives. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, everybody. We'll see you Wednesday night, if you can be on at 30 at 30, okay? All right. Thank you, Pastor Brian. You're welcome. Bye. God bless you. All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.